thank you and, and welcome back to um, our conference on the stuff of the early modern Atlantic world. And um, a huge shout out to Rukshana Jalil for uh, all of her assistance throughout the conference. Um, we, we couldn't have done it without you, Rukshana. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to um, present our, our last two speakers, uh, Russ Leo and the intrepid Jonathan Scott, all the way from Auckland, New Zealand, where it's now 7.15 a.m. on Saturday. Um, at the topic of this session is strategies of emerging empires. Uh, so first, Russ Leo uh, is an associate professor at Princeton, and he's author of Tragedy is Philosophy in the Reformation World. He's now working on a book on racial capitalism in the early modern Atlantic world, looking particularly at emergent notions of labor and indigeneity in political economy. And his talk for today is entitled Spinoza's Dream, Caribbean Slavery, and the Emergence of Political Economy. Uh, following um, Russ Leo, we'll have Jonathan Scott, professor of history at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. He previously taught at the universities of Cambridge and Pittsburgh, and his most recent book, How the Old World Ended the Anglo-Dutch American Revolution, 1500 to 1800, was published by Yale in 2020. And today he'll speak about agricultural imperialism. So uh, I, I, I cede the floor to you, Russ, Leo, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, and I really wanna begin by thanking Faisal and Claire for including me in this event, um, Rakshana for organizing, and all of the other presenters. Um, it's been a real education and a respite from quarantine isolation. Um, that is to say, it's been a great joy. Let me begin by trying to make the stakes of this brief paper clear. In the Taylor manuscript from the National Library of Jamaica, that is, in John Taylor's account of Jamaica, written in 1687, a text that figures prominently in Sylvia Winter's unpublished masterwork, Black Metamorphosis, we find an entirely standard depiction of the work of enslaved people. Let me read from it. Now we come to show the accustomed manner used here in clearing of their ground in order to make it fit to plant. In order to which know that having taken up as many acres as the planter thinks fit and having laid out the bound lines of his land and received his plat and patent thereof from the governor and being provided with Negro slaves and axes, hoes, etc he begins to work. He causes them to cut down all the wood, both small and great, in as much of it as he is then in ability to plant. So this will come as no surprise to the other speakers at this conference, or really even to the readers of country house poems and other landscape fictions. It's no surprise, in other words, that the enslaved people recede into the background of the description, that labor is really tantamount to mastery over labor, and that the enslaved people are used and directed in a way that renders them as tools. This is, of course, markedly distinct from that which counts as labor to the letter in virtually every work of liberal political economy or political arithmetic produced across early modernity. And this is thus distinct from accounts of labor power and value, not only in Marx in the critique of political economy, but in any of his interlocutors across foundational works of classical political economy. Once again, this isn't particularly surprising that enslaved people are not afforded the free sale of their labor power. 
Many, many historians and theorists have said as much from Eric Williams and Cedric Robinson to Sylvia Winter and Sylvia Federici. And this distinction is crucial to racial capitalism as to opposed to a capitalism that assumes all laborers are free to sell their labor power. In many ways, their first alienable possession. So what I've been trying to discover, however, is how this takes shape in foundational works of political economy in the 17th and 18th centuries, paying particular attention to William Petty, John Locke, and other anthropological approaches to labor and political arithmetic. And reading forward, I've been attempting to discover how and under what circumstances the labor of enslaved people counts as work. Now, when I initially proposed this paper, um, I had planned to take a trip to um, Amsterdam and The Hague to read records from the West Indies Company. Because of COVID, I've been un unable to do that. So I'm going to focus rather much more today on Spinoza's dream in this crucial letter and what this might offer as a kind of point of departure towards a study of political economy and labor. So on June 26th, I, I realize I keep saying Spinoza's dream as if like, you know, that, that's, it, it's well known. It's, it's not, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get into that here. Um, so on June 26th, 1664, the Mennonite merchant and collegian Peter Balling wrote to his friend and collaborator, Baruch Spinoza. The subject of his letter, the death of Balling's young son. Balling described to Spinoza a perplexing phenomenon. Before his son died, that is, when he was still healthy and well, Balling was troubled during his sleep, startled to consciousness by sighs or lamentations. It's a little tricky to translate. In Latin, it's gemitus, in Dutch, it's zuchte. Um, so it could be sighs, lamentations in general. Balling took these disturbing sounds as an omen for telling his son's death. In his July 20th response, Spinoza expresses his sadness upon hearing of Balling's son's death. And he seems to emphasize in a manner that follows from his ethics, which he was thinking through at the time, he seems to emphasize that an adequate understanding of this phenomena might bring bawling relief. This was not a true sigh or lamentation, Spinoza explains. It was rather bawling's imagination at its most vivid, his imagination when it was unfettered and free. In Latin, it's salute et libera, and in Dutch, it's los and fry. After all, when Balling sat up in bed and listened intently, when he focused his hearing, he did not hear the sounds as clearly as before or after once he returned to sleep, at which point the groans or lamentations apparently renewed their intensity. So Spinoza says this is not a true um, experience. You didn't, you, those, that was not, those were not truly lamentations. But he nevertheless does identify the sighing that Balling, Balling herds as an omen or a voorspoke. But in a remarkably distinct, rational sense, he says in the letter, the mind can confusedly be aware beforehand of something which is future. Hence, it can imagine it as firmly and vividly as if a thing of that kind were present. In other words, there's nothing supernatural about this. Considered from a different perspective, Balling, in his love for his son, understood the idea of his son's essence, its affections, and its consequences. 
In these moments of minimal consciousness, however, intuition seems to have given way to imagination. An otherwise adequate understanding of the sun gives way to an inadequate or confused understanding. Whereas Balling was generally able to intuit consequences and apprehend the natural connection between his son's health and his impending illness. Here at the edges of consciousness, these connections are apprehended imperfectly. And this is what Balling calls an omen. And Spinoza attempts, in other words, to account for this omen as an inadequate imaginative account of an otherwise intuitive relationship. It's as if he recognizing that recognizes that Balling gives an inadequate imaginative account of a process that he otherwise apprehends by intuition, as if unconsciously. Thus, in his response, Spinoza attempts to comfort his friend by claiming that this imaginative connection between the groans bawling heard and his son's impending illness were really evidence of his intuitive understanding of his son, an understanding that evinces, by way of the ethics, an abiding love for said son. But what makes this moving letter relevant to our conference this afternoon and this morning is Spinoza's account of his own dream. And I read it here. One morning, as the sky was already growing light, I woke from a very deep dream to find that the images which had come to me in my dream remained before my eyes as vividly as if the things had been true especially the image of a certain black, scabby Brazilian whom I had never seen before. In Latin, it's quiustam nigri et scabiosi brasiliani. In Dutch, it's eins vartes de brasilian. For the most part, this image disappeared when, to divert myself with something else, I fixed my eyes on a book or some other object. But as soon as I turn my eyes back away from such an object without fixing my eyes attentively on anything, the same image of the same black man appeared to me with the same vividness alternately until it gradually disappeared from my visual field. There have been notable attempts to interpret this scene in this letter, among intellectual historians, historians of philosophy, and theorists of racial capitalism. It figures prominently, for instance, in Hartman Negri's work. Let me focus, though, on one of the earliest and most ambitious attempts to interpret this dream, before ending by way of resituating it in the letter. In a signal essay, essay from 1957, Lewis Feuer turned directly to psychoanalysis to make sense of it, foregrounding how Spinoza was at once willing to interpret Balling's experience as an omen, but unwilling to accord his own vision the same status. Feuer claims that, and I quote, Spinoza's theory of dreams seems to have been largely a resistance device to prevent the analysis of his own dream. The language of the letter at odds with this theory of dreams indicates an anxiety as to the underlying significance of the symbol of the black and scabby Brazilian. Once again, I quote there. In Fuhrer's account, the figure obviously indexes the regimes of racialization and labor in the larger Atlantic world. In the traffic, in enslaved people, as well as in the commodities that were produced through the labor of enslaved people. For Fuhrer, however, the figure 
ultimately registers obliquely Spinoza's traumatic excommunication from the Portuguese Jewish community in Amsterdam in 1656. Let me reproduce his logic. This is Fuhr's logic. It follows thus. The rabbi, Isaac Aboab da Fonseca, a prominent figure in the Talmud Torah congregation in Amsterdam, had served in the Jewish community in Pernambuco until the Dutch lost control of Brazil in 1654. Among the Portuguese forces that expelled the Dutch ranked Enrique Diaz, a hero of the war of the Pernambucan restoration. Diaz, a free black soldier who commanded what was known as the Black Regiment, composed of enslaved and freed people in service of the Portuguese. Now in Fewer's circuitous reading, Enrique Diaz was responsible for the rabbi Eboab da Fonseca's return to Amsterdam, where he would play a prominent role in the proceedings against Spinoza. This particular rabbi might have read the text of the harem in 1656, that is Spinoza's excommunication, although that's not certain. And so in Fuhrer's reading, the spectral figure from the dream seizes responsibility for the excommunication and becomes the symbol of all the hostile forces of hatred that Spinoza excommunicate would have to deal with alone. And so Fuhrer identifies the figure from Spinoza's dream as probably none other than Enrique Diaz. Now, admittedly speculative, Fewer's reading is ultimately unsatisfying. It's even reductive. Although there's a certain charm to mid-century psychoanalytic biography. I kind of like reading things like this because it's not really about history. It's always about the, the revolutionary neurosis of one figure. And whether or not that's helpful for doing history or understanding the past, it makes for a good read. But it's crucial, however, insofar as Fewer situates Spinoza and is unconscious in a larger Atlantic world system. Many other treatments of the letter, those that really preceded Fuhrer, they situate, um, they dwell on the theory of the imagination. Spinoza invokes Brazil and Afro-Brazilian people, free and enslaved here. And we are drawn from the domestic scene into a much larger Atlantic milieu. Since Fuhrer's 1957 essay, many scholars have expanded this field of inquiry. Stephen Nadler, for instance, has explicated Spinoza's own economic interests in, Car in the Caribbean and the interests of his family. Moreover, foundational studies by Cornelius Hossinger, um, Peter Emmer, and Johannes Menepostma deliver illuminating accounts of Dutch involvement in the production of sugar and tobacco and the traffic in enslaved people between Africa's West Coast, Brazil, the Wild Coast, that is Guiana, and New Netherland. Just as it's well documented, most recently by Michel van Gosse, that, and I quote, the rise and fall of Dutch Brazil was one of the most heavily covered news stories of the Dutch Golden Age, and that the success of the Republican government of the Netherlands, as well as the fate of the West India Company, representing the interests of thousands of burger like shareholders, hinged on the fate of Dutch Brazil and the Wild Coast. Affairs across the Atlantic were not only of great interest to curious readers in Amsterdam, they were absolutely integral to the city's prosperity and the national struggle against Spain that lasted until 1648. This was especially true at mid-century with the future of Dutch Brazil at stake. Brazil and the Wild Coast would support plantations, enabling the cultivation of sugar and tobacco in ways that Curaçao, for instance, could not. And it should also be said that Dutch interest in slavery intensified in this period, and that the West India Company maintained an effective supremacy in the direct and indirect slave trade to Spanish America until 1672, that is, with the foundation of the Royal Africa Company. And so that we can begin to situate Dutch careers in the Atlantic world in relation to English adventures, 
Let's note the Dutch effectively ceased to be a major factor in the Caribbean by the late 1670s, in that turbulent decade that saw the invasion of the United Provinces, as well as the Peace of Nijmegen in 1678. Fewer and others have read this figure in Spinoza's stream symptomatically as a rare reference, really a rare reference among rationalists and advocates of radical enlightenment to early modern race, racialization, and, and slavery. An index not only of Spinoza's own imprecation, but also the ubiquity and intensity throughout Holland of the news of Dutch involvement in the slave trade. But let me return by way of conclusion here to the letter itself and consider anew why Spinoza strangely refuses to accord this figure the status of an omen. Balling's love for his son, read his adequate understanding of his son's essence affords him insight into causality and consequence as it relates to the child, in this case, to the child's health. This is the third kind of knowledge to which Spinoza attends in part two of the ethics. This is, however, obscured in this instance as bawling as admittedly unfocused, drowsy. And so it's as if Spinoza tells bawling that even in his apparent confusion, he actually has an intuitive understanding of his son. He just doesn't know it at that moment. But Spinoza cannot say the same thing about the figure that appears to him in the waking vision, this racialized figure that registers an Atlantic milieu. He cannot claim any such knowledge. This is particularly frustrating considering that in his very explanation of intuition and in the ethics, to which he points in his response to Balling, we find another rare, quote unquote, real world example in an otherwise abstract account of reason. He explains intuition because merchants exercise intuition when they relate numbers by proportion. It's telling that if we try to locate Spinoza apropos contemporary political economy, he cannot approach this figure with the same certainty, the same intuition, the same familiarity as Balling can approach health and the health of his son. He registers here a gap between the inability to understand the figure and the intuitive matters of calculation and value. Thanks, I'll end there. Thank you, and, and uh, now uh, Jonathan Scott, thank you. Thank you, Claire, that was a fantastic paper. Um, I'm excited to see all of you inhabitants of the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, I'm very grateful to you for having me among you, and especially to uh, Faisal for inviting me quite a long time ago, and to Claire for helping me um, get set up for today. So um, my paper is called Agricultural Imperialism, a title which is inspired by Alfred Crosby's classic, Ecological Imperialism. That book, completed while Crosby was a visiting fellow in New Zealand, taught historians of empire to pay attention less to colonizers themselves than to what he called their entire traveling field of biota. My subject today is the impact of one peculiar species of British colonization resulting not from any resources that it contrived to extract, but rather its successful export of a way of life. Three features distinguished early modern British colonial settlement in temperate Ireland and North America from its plantations in tropical Barbados, Jamaica, and India, for instance, and also from Spanish, Dutch, and French possessions around the world. The first was the establishment of colonies as confessional outposts of predominantly Calvinist Protestantism, a planting of people rather than things. This began in Ireland as a government-sponsored instrument of imperial control, but it continued in North America as a means of security and refuge from the Stuart crown itself. More broadly, early modern Europe's wars of religion unleashed the largest international migration in its history to that date. 
one which became transatlantic in scope. This saw 16th century Protestants fleeing from Germany and France into the Netherlands, from the Southern Netherlands to the North, and from France and the Low Countries to, to Southeastern England. It saw 17th century Scots and English Calvinists fleeing Laudianism to the Netherlands, before then in many cases joining their compatriots traveling west to Ireland and North America. The second distinct feature of early modern British or perhaps more precisely English colonization was its deployment as a means of offloading surplus population. Between 1540 and 1640, the population of England and Wales doubled. Between 1700 and 1800, it doubled again. These developments propelled the demographic transformation of London from 55,000 people in 1560 to 550,000 in 1700 and to 1 million by 1800. And they also set in motion a flood of migrants to all the English settlements of the Atlantic world. In 1584, Western planting had been championed by Richard Hacklett the Younger, as John Donoghue has told us today, as a means, quote, for the manifold employment of numbers of idle men, as we are grown more populous than ever heretofore. Departing from Massachusetts Bay in 1629, John Winthrop recorded among his reasons that England was overpopulated and growing weary of her inhabitants, as well as the plea that the move would perfect the Reformation. Between 1630 and 1642, 120,000 English and Scots migrated to Ireland, 60,000 to the English Caribbean, and 20,000 to North America. By contrast, in the much more densely populated Low Countries, the 17th century Dutch economy depended upon imported labor. Jewish and Christian, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese, German, French, and English. The Dutch colony of New Holland and Brazil, about which we've just been hearing, fell in 1654, partly because it could not attract large-scale domestic immigration. The same problem limited New Netherland, founded in 1624. As the governor, Pieter Stuyvesant, complained to the West Indies Company, neighboring English and French colonies were, quote, populated by their own nation and countrymen, and consequently bound together more firmly and united, while your honors colonies are only gradually and slowly peopled by the scrapings of all sorts of nationalities. From the 1650s, incursions from the expanding English colonies to the north became constant. And when in 1664, four English ships demanded the surrender of New Amsterdam on Manhattan Island, Stuyvesant found himself unable to resist particularly after English settlers, settlers on Long Island declared themselves obliged to assist the invaders. From Massachusetts, Winthrop celebrated the way, quote, thus made for the enlargement of His Majesty's dominions by filling that vacant wilderness in time with plantatios of His Majesty's subjects. Historian Alfred Thayer Mahan commented, in the East Indies, in Africa, and in America, the Dutch were far ahead of England. But although the origin of these colonies, purely commercial in its character, was natural, there seems to have been lacking to them a principle of growth. This placid satisfaction with gain alone, unaccompanied by political ambition, tended, like the despotism of France and Spain, to keep the colonies mere commercial dependencies upon the mother country, and so killed the natural principle of growth. Yet in exhibiting this so-called principle of growth, England was in fact singular. Across the 16th century, 250,000 Spaniards had traveled to the Crown's new colonies in the Americas. However, between 1640 and 1780, one and a half million British settlers migrated to the Americas, 600,000 to Jamaica, and 900,000 to North America. By the end of the Seven Years' War, quote, whereas the whole French population of North America amounted to about 55,000, the white colonists of the British mainland provinces numbered at least 1.1 million and owned an additional quarter million enslaved African Americans. 
to the disgust of Monsieur Trepagny in any Prue's novel, Barkskins, the English send thousands to their colonies, but France cannot be bothered. In the century after 1815, 22 million migrants left Britain for its colonies and, and its colonies and North America, contributing to an increase in the global population of English speaking settlers from New York and Chicago to San Francisco, Melbourne and New Zealand from around 12 million to 200 million. As these figures suggest, migration was only the initial basis for this astonishing rate of increase. In English speaking North America, endogenous expansion was much more important. During the 18th century, this subsection of European empire became demographically explosive because it was outside the zone of mosquito borne tropical diseases. The result was a rate of growth sufficient to double their population every 26 years. By contrast, in Jamaica, where 90% of white immigrants died within five years, half a million new arrivals barely kept the settler population stable. Within the British Empire, the North American colonies were distinguished by their capacity to, to attract large scale migration, which was voluntary rather than indentured or enslaved, and culturally rather than simply economically motivated. The third distinguishing feature of this planting of people rather than things was social and economic. As in Spanish Central and South America, Dutch and French North American colonies were established primarily to harvest resources, in particular timber, furs and fish. The same was true of the Russian Empire in Siberia and the Northwest Pacific. Within these economies of extraction, native skills and lifeways were often useful sometimes crucial. For the demographically expansive North American British settlements, however, what was essential was the practice and development of settler agriculture. In the words of one 17th century observer, the Dutch did never much thrive in planting. They were interested only in war and trade, not in clearing, breaking up of the ground and planting as the English have done. As a result, whereas Dutch merchants, quote, keeping themselves most within their own cells and warehouses, minded their gain alone, unquote, the English abroad, quote, carried their way of life with them, establishing it in the new communities they encountered. Thus, whereas Spanish, Dutch, and French empires all supported major extractive economies, England's laid the foundation for the global export of a way of life. By comparison to the Netherlands, Tudor and early Stuart England was rural rather than urban, aristocratic rather than mercantile, and monarchical rather than republican. By comparison to Spain, Italy, and France, where aristocratic culture was urban, civility residing in cities, England's nobility preferred the countryside. As Peter Halen observed, the residents of the nobility beautifieth a city with stately and magnificent buildings, which makes the city of it cities of Italy so much excel ours in England, their nobles dwelling in the cities, and ours for the most part in their country houses. Thomas Spratt agreed, other European nobilities prefer the pleasures of the town, we those of the field. According to John Eliot, this was one reason British America remained in comparison with Spanish America an overwhelmingly rural society. In the words of Paul Slack, Elizabethan colonization in North America rested explicitly on planting and cultivating the land as a justification for possession of thinly peopled territories, quite different from the empires and cities which the Spanish had encountered in the South. For this mode of colonization, what was essential was territory. When from Leiden in 1620, the English congregation of William Bradford pondered their removal to some new place, quote, the place they had thoughts on was some of those vast unpeopled countries of America, which are fruitful and fit for habitation, being devoid of all civil inhabitants, where there are only savage and brutish men which range up and down little otherwise than wild beasts, unquote. Comparing Dutch and English movements in Connecticut during the 1630s, Donna Merrick commented, 
among other things, they're using space differently as linear in the case of the Netherlanders, as planal in that of the English. The Dutch are voyagers, travelers enacting their transients. For the English, Saybrook is a foothold to inland places, to broad and allegedly unsettled valleys suitable for the beginning of rural communities. According to Native Americans, the Dutch were something on water, but of no account on land. Employees of the West Indies Company in New Amsterdam eschewing a civilizing or Christianizing mission invited local Algonquian speaking peoples into a trading relationship. Only gradually did the situation deteriorate into a war between 1640 and 45, resulting in hundreds of native deaths. By contrast, English settlers moving south from Massachusetts into the Connecticut plantation were seeking not simply trade, but, quote, land abounding with rich and profitable meadows along all the rivers, various species of good wood, varieties of fish, fowl in abundance. These settlers did have a Christian mission, both for the natives and themselves. They were confronted by the Picos, who sought to make peace with the Narragansetts, arguing that the English were strangers and began to overspread their country and would deprive them thereof in time if they were suffered to grow and increase. The Narragansetts sided with the English, who then responded to Pico hostility with a war of extermination. When during the burning of a village at Mystic River in 1637, killing between 400 and 700 Picos, survivors fled, they encountered English soldiers who received them, quote, with the point of the sword. Down fell men, women, and children. With the wind, all was quickly on a flame, and thereby more were burned to death than was otherwise slain. Those that escaped the fire were slain with the sword. Some hewed to pieces, others run through with their rapiers. It was a fearful sight to see them thus frying in the fire and the streams of blood quenching the same, and horrible was the stink and scent thereof, but the victory seemed a sweet sacrifice, and they gave the praise thereof to God. While Merrick perceived in both of these conflicts the predatory brutality towards civilians characteristic of Europe's 30 years war, in fact, Mystic River unmistakably recalls English conduct in Ireland. In the words of John Underhill, we had sufficient light from the word of God for our proceedings. 60 years later, Gabriel Thomas reported from Philadelphia that the climate was fabulous, bearing mighty resemblance to the better part of France, food cheap and game abundant, wages triple those in England and Wales, the earth so fertile and available for 10 to 15 pounds for 10 acres, fine and delightful gardens and orchards in most parts of this country. The natives were peaceable. The first planters had been Dutch, who, however, made little or no improvement, applying themselves wholly to traffic in skins and furs, which the Indian, Indians furnished them with for rum, strong liquors, and sugar. Soon after them came the Swedes and Finns, who applied themselves to husbandry and were the first Christian people that made any considerable improvement there. By 1740, the population of Pennsylvania was increasing by 150% per decade, something only sustain sustainable in an agricultural society by expansion of territory. The resulting westward push into the Ohio River Valley provoked the Seven Years or French and Indian War of 1747 to 54. According to Jack Green, among the things that contemporaries thought distinguished the societies of colonial British America from those of the old world were comparative religious and ethnic diversity, extraordinary demographic and economic growth after 1715, and most distinctive and significant, the remarkably wide distribution of property among free people. A much higher proportion of the free colonial population owned real property than was the case in England or in any other old world society. Bas van Bavel elaborates. The English settlers were obsessed with acquiring their own land, preferably by way of ownership of a family-sized farm. It was the ideal of many to become an independent yeoman, 
an ideal imported from Britain where the status had become much harder to realize. In New England and other parts of the North, freeholding became widespread. Also, income inequality in the colonies was much lower. With the richest 1% of households only having 7% of total income, colonial America in 1774 was the most equal society in the documented parts of the 18th century world. One intellectual product of this demographically explosive, territorially expansive agricultural imperialism was the idealization of America as a republic of citizen farmers. Echoing James Harrington's account of the Roman Republic in the Commonwealth of Oceania published in 1656, Thomas Jefferson wrote in 1785, cultivators of the earth are the most valuable citizens. They are the most vigorous, the most independent, the most virtuous, and they are tied to their country and wedded to its liberty by the most lasting bonds. A broader unintended result appears to have been the Industrial Revolution. This did not first occur in China or in France, partly because one of its preconditions was the development in temperate climate British North America of the most dynamic market driving the growth of British manufacturers. To this extent, what turned out to be crucial about European global empires in triggering the Industrial Revolution was less the resources they yielded than their cultural behavior, in this case, their capacity to consume. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. Yet the more immediate consequence of this distinct mode of British settlement was the devastating territorial dispossession of native peoples. Of course, all colonization involved both migration and the appropriation of resources, including territory. But not all involved the global metastasization of a particular way of life, and with it, a veritable paving over of large parts of the world. Because the planting of people and culture required land, which was also everywhere the foundation for indigenous cultural practices and life ways, the price paid for the export of one culture in North America, Australasia, and elsewhere was the near or total destruction of many others. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. And, and also, Russ, maybe could you please turn your camera back on? Um, we have time for some questions now, and I'm, I'm wondering um, if any of the other panelists would like to ask either Jonathan or, or Russ a question. I thought they were both very different, but very intense papers. One, this close reading, uh, beautiful close reading that you did, Russ, of Spinoza's dream and then a, a brilliant example of how you can read uh, the global in the local, right? Um, a global early modern doesn't <laughs> just have to be macro study. It can it can open up a, a passage like that in a text into its its interconnections. And then Jonathan, it's a magisterial reading of uh, settler colonialism as ag agricultural imperialism, um, incredibly. Um, uh, documented and, and, and uh, expansively argued. Um, I, we have a question from John Donahoe here. John, please unmute yourself. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, thank you, Russ, and thank you, Jonathan, for uh, such wonderful and thoughtful papers. And uh, I think the complexity and sophistication of both are just a, a wonderful way to sort of wrap up today, uh, which has been food for thought since 1030 when we started. But my, uh, I don't know if this is so much a question or just maybe a thought that, that Jonathan might want to respond to. Um, I really uh, appreciate the differentiation in terms of, of sort of social cultural ways of, of, of organizing the way people live. And we have an urban sort of centered empire in Spanish America. We have a commercial empire that, that leads to urbanization in places like New Netherland um, or sort of lonely outposts in, in the wild country of, in Guyana or in Pernambuco. And then we have this sort of expansive agricultural 
empire forming in, in British North America that Jonathan, you said sort of stems from the, the aristocratic ideal of the rural life in England versus sort of the aristocratic ideal, of the urban life in a place like Spain or France. But yet there's a tension that we see particularly in the 17th century in both New England, which is not a plantation colony in terms of, of you know, slave labor and cash crops, uh, as well as in the Chesapeake, where um, first with sort of joint stock company problems with the Virginia Company, the Massachusetts Bay with settlers sort of uh, expanding in an unregulated fashion that caused headaches for colonial um, governments in terms of inflaming tensions on the frontier and producing costly wars, uh, as well as sort of the, the problems with how do you govern and control and instill social order that replicates England without a centralized sort of pattern of settlement. And so there's all kinds of disputes, both in the Chesapeake and in colonial New England, about towns splitting up, uh, wanting to sort of go out on their own. Salem would be an example. Edicts restraining colonial settlement in the Chesapeake to avoid Indian wars, but also to create more commercial centers. So Jonathan, I wanted you to, to sort of speak to that, to, to sort of maybe flesh out that tension for us, please. Can you summarize the tension in one sentence, John? Yes. <laughs> the tension. You know, I, have, I have been listening carefully to what you said. Sure. What is the ten I wanted, what's the tension, though? The tension is uh, sort of the cultural transatlantic um, transfer of the, the rural aristocratic ideal in England. Okay. And sort of so, the, the colonial settler expansive society versus so, the, go ahead. No, please finish. And then the, the tension is with this, this problem that colonial governments have of, of restricting settlement and wanting to produce more commercial and urban centers. I mean, one initial point is that um, there's an extraordinary variety and complexity of local colonial government types and experiences and episodes over time. So my paper has been extremely broad brush and I haven't got into that level of detail. Um, the, mo the general thing I want to say though is that although I have said that in an, in an attempt to uh, summarize the peculiarities of England as a society in European terms, I have made this contrast with the Netherlands on the one hand, mm -hmm by comparison to which England is an aristocratic and monarchical society, and then Spain and uh, France on the other. Um, I'm not saying that this agricultural imperialism is a specifically aristocratic ideal. In fact, it's not. It's a kind of yeoman-like mm -hmm. ideal. It's um, primarily the, the people who travel are in large part ext extremely poor, and they're leaving the country because they have nothing and they're hoping for something better. And so what's, what is frequently established in North America by these migrants is an upwardly mobile common persons would be agricultural utopia. So it's not aristocratic, particularly. Okay. Um, most of the aristocrats stay at home because they don't need to leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I really do see that um sort of cultural difference um, that the English try to promote uh, in terms of like frontier expansion, that's always an imperative. But at the same time, you know, there's that contradiction with wanting to build up commercial centers. So I, you know, I would encourage you to pursue this line of thought and the complications will only make it more interesting. Okay. Because it is the yeoman's republic that becomes sort of the dominant political and cultural ideology in America. I mean, just that one final thing, um, the example of Virginia, the, the first North American mainland colony um, is interesting because it's not particularly a religious foundation, although many of the early settlers do belong to Protestant religious groups. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it's heavily driven by um, economic and commercial imperatives 
and its migrants are sometimes voluntary, but also uh, in important to an important extent uh, involuntary. I mean, um, Bridewell Hospital is cleared of all of its patients, and they're put on ships for Virginia and so on. So this. Of the three things, the three features of this mode of colonization that I mentioned, um, the migrational character of this quote unquote imperialism is, I think, the most important one. It's, um, it's a huge irony that Brexit appears to have been motivated primarily by hostility to migration yeah. uh, in a country which has spread migrants all around the world and established its language as the world language as a result of this. So I think the idea seems to be that you send tens of millions of people around the world to colonize other countries. And then in um, 2016, you pull up the drawbridge and say that we will not tolerate in migration in the other direction. And we don't need to, because we have the world language. <laughs> Other other questions. Well, it looks I like Faisal we, has. Yeah, if we have a, a moment, um, I've got a quick question for Jonathan. And um, one of the things I I gather from uh, from the, the story you've just unfolded for us, and uh, perhaps you might sort of confirm this or or clarify, is that if we look at the sort of early end of the period, you know, late sixteenth century, early seventeenth century there's a push migration, right? Offloading surplus population. But then by the tail end of the 17th century, the, the dynamic's different. I mean, there's economic thought that um, emphasizes holding onto population as a source of yes. national wealth. And then when we get into the 18th century, it seems to be a pull of high wages uh, to the colonies that's, that's sort of drawing workers there. And perhaps also the voyage has become a little safer um, by late 17th, early 18th century. Um, so that's, so even though the, the sort of migration is I don't know, steady, I mean, although with, with sort of peaks and valleys, um, that there are fundamentally different things at work there still. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's very important. So uh, yes, you're right that the, the push behind migration associated with population increase, that the population increase in England and Wales uh, stops in 1640 or in the 1640s and doesn't resume until about 1700. Um, and it's true that uh, in the later 17th century, there is, in the context of what is unusually a slight decline in the domestic population, there is widespread anxiety about immigration and about its impact on national wealth, on the supply of labor and so on. Um, interestingly, that anxiety um, doesn't produce an end to immigration. Um, uh, it's expressed as a commentary on the large numbers of people who continue to travel to the Caribbean and to North America in particular. Um, uh, and then in the 18th century, when population increase resumes, um, migration ramps up considerably, but not, I think, simply because population increase has um, resumed um, for other reasons including the ones you mentioned, that um, that territory has been secured, that resources are there, that they are being advertised vigorously. Um, uh, and, you know, the, as I said in my paper, the greatest migration occurs in the late 18th and 19th century. Um, so this, this is, is a, it's a long, complicated process, and there are a lot of factors at work, not simply, not simply domestic population increase. We have, we have a question now for, for Russ from Nathan uh, Nikolic. Uh, Russ, do you know any early modern political economists who do incorporate slave labor into their account of work or political economy? Have you come across anyone who, who tries to deal with this? 
Well, um, of the kind of the examples with which I'm familiar, and I've kind of just methodologically been trying to work back from um, Marx's sources in Capital and like all the materials that he's reading in the critique of political economy. Um, and thus far, it's been very difficult for me to find um, works that kind of collapse these distinctions that are so often taken for granted between um, you know, the free sale of one's labor and um, laboring bodies that are not denied. Like if free sale is the horizon that defines work as work, in political economy, then slavery almost always is excluded from that. Um, so what I'm going to do next is just try to find, and, and again, as soon as the pandemic is over, I, uh, is to go and actually look at WIC documents um, and to try to get a sense of, you know, in, in other registers outside of that kind of classic classical political economy um, and an archive with which at least I'm generally much more familiar, how uh, the, the, the work of enslaved people figures into um, just a certain kind of liberal trajectory. Another question from John Donahue. John? Sorry about that, gosh. Okay, this will be very short. Um, I, I would urge Nathan and Russ to think about looking for slavery in political economy at least in the 17th century, not so much in the early writings of, of political economy, not, not so much in the, in the pamphlet discourse, but I would look for it in colonial official correspondence and state papers. That's where it is. The discourse is behind the reality. It's not creating the reality. Right. And I think this, this is an essential point for us to understand. Oftentimes the discourse of slavery and political uh, economy is a fait accompli after the slave trading empires are formed, or at least they're they're past the embryonic stage. So, and I have a slew of references for both of you. Uh, oh, that'd so be I'm excellent. Happy to provide them for you. No, I would I would love that. I've already I've already learned so much from from your talk and your work. So I I'll, I will follow up with you on that. Thanks so much, Russ. I appreciate Thank it. You. I'm happy to Thank be you. collaborating. <laughs> Very helpful. That's great. Uh, just checking to see uh, Nigel Smith. Uh, Okay, we have a comment from Nigel Smith. He'd be an unorthodox member of the political economist, but Thomas Tryon talks about slavery as part of the colonial and global economy. Actually, Nigel, did you want to say anything more? I, it, it turns out... <laughs> Very, it's a very uh, cumbersome system we have here where the, the, the audience has to ask questions in the, in the uh, Q&A. Donna, were you trying to, Donna, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Is that okay? I had a very quick, uh, um, you know, when you said Spinoza's dream, what comes immediately to mind to me is Descartes' dream, the very, mm -hmm. very early one. I think it's 1619, but I could be wrong, where he imagines this, this whole tree of knowledge and figures out how he's gonna move forward in this very heroic way. Um, I guess my, when you were talking about that really wonderful reading of Spinoza's dream, what does Spinoza think of his dream? How does he, I mean, you talked about um, uh, Fuhrer and, and other people like that, but I'm just curious about what work does it do for him and why does he uh, inscribe it? All right, well, thank you. Um, well, one of the things he does is he draws a, a distinction that's actually foreign to his mature philosophy between what he experiences and between what Balling experiences. And so it's one of the things that, uh, er, like, um, 
earlier critics and historians of philosophy would say, this is a strange moment because Spinoza says Balling is experiencing an omen, whereas his own um, dream, he more or less um, um, claims is caused by purely bodily, like, something like it, 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 it's this weird moment where he might as well be writing like Burton. Like it sounds like a, it, it, it's, it's a step away from a kind of humoral language. But huh. It's actually that it, what makes it interesting is that's what's been read typically as, as a resistance for him because in his writing that concurrent in like the draft versions of the Ethica, he's he basically says that that what he offers as a reading shouldn't be a licit reading of yeah. a dream that involves imagination. Um, right. So critics have typically said this is a it's a strange moment of inconsistency. Um, and so that's what's really fueled a, a long history of psychoanalytic readings that are saying like, whether, like I said, I, I, I don't know how compelling most of those psychoanalytic readings are, yeah. but to, to then consider how his dream, his, his, his um, reluctance to talk about it with the same attention that he gives Balling's account of these sighs is really interesting particularly what, what folks have done with it recently, which is to say this indexes so many crucial elements, not just of his life as a merchant, and at this point his life as, a, as an ex-merchant, but also virtually everything happening in Amsterdam in the public sphere at this moment. Thank you. I've tried to unmute Nigel. I don't know if you can speak. Well, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfect, okay. Okay, good. I don't, I don't, ah, ah, okay. All right, I don't think I can make myself visible um, with the tools I've got here. Um, anyway, uh, so thank you for both papers. Just to amplify the, the comment. Um, so there's, there's one, um, Russ, there's one very obvious example of, of, uh, of somebody, you know, Thomas Tryon, the vegetarian theorist, does, does build slavery into his analysis of what's wrong with plantations um, and, and what's wrong with the European um, economy and why it's beggaring the global economy. Um, and, and how he does that by using a variety of ancient and early modern sources, um, which he comes at pretty much as an autodidact is a, is a question we're still trying to solve. But I think it's, it's a very interesting one. He did spend time in Barbados. Oh, that's great, that's great. So I think I think you ought to, to you ought to look at him um, amongst amongst other people, and 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 yes, okay, I think that's fine for the time being. Great, thanks. No, that's that's excellent. Well, other questions. I I think we we have gone about almost twenty minutes over time. Uh, it's been a very wonderful. Uh, day, great conference. I, I, I can't imagine um, better papers and papers that also spoke to each other so well. And I'm happy to let you know that um, in part because of uh, the generosity of Faisal and, and Eric Song in, in their contribution to the conference, we're going to be able to um, get this um, captioned and put up on, on the CUNY YouTube channel. We, ca we can't put it up on the YouTube channel until we have the professional captioning done, but that will be done. And, and as soon as um, everything is available, um, Rukshana and I will make sure that you all get access um, to the recording of the conference. But uh, I just want again to thank um, Faisal Mohammed and Nathan uh, Nikolic and and again Rikshana Jalil uh, for help and also to all of the, the speakers who were just brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to our, Thank you. our audience. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye bye. You. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Wonderful. so much, everybody. Thank you. Russ, we'll be in touch, okay? That sounds great. I'd love that. Awesome. Okay. And Nathan too. Jonathan. Good to see you again, John. I tried yeah, hey. to ask you a question after your paper, but I couldn't operate my machinery. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to, to see you. 
I can't chat now, but I would love to set up a chat next week over Zoom. Uh, yeah. We have okay. so much to catch up on. Cool. Okay, man. I'll send you an email. Good to see you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care. Get some Thanks sleep. Again, Claire, for all of your, I mean, you you showed great endurance moderating for the whole day there. Oh no, I enjoyed it. And as as Russ said, it was it was a joy. Really, these papers were brilliant, and they will bear you know um, listening to again. And I I hope you will all you know be publishing parts of these soon. It sounds like there there's a lot of great work out there, and I was particularly pleased at the way the papers spoke to each other. Right, I, everyone mentioned that. Valerie mentioned that. And, so thanks a million to everyone. I really enjoyed it. And, and so did, I'm sure I, I got, you know, people were texting me on my phone from the audience. They couldn't, they couldn't chat. They couldn't all <laughs> communicate through the chat, but I got a lot of great uh, feedback. So take care. Take, take care, care, everyone. Thanks. Enjoy take your week. Be well. Be well. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.